All right, well, welcome everyone to the breakout session, conversations around equity, inclusion and diversity on how to make the outdoors an inclusive space for everyone. My name is Mara Chavez, my pronouns are she, her, and I will be the moderator for this panel today. I'd like to briefly introduce before we begin our bound, our mission and our panelists for this evening. So NWAVS has been serving the community of the Pacific Northwest for over 56 years, developing leadership skills, character, integrity, and compassion among our students over time. The goal every year for our bound courses is for students to discover their fullest potential through experiential learning, manifesting in, for, in the form of increased self-confidence. Oh, I'm sorry. For students to discover their fullest potential through experiential learning, manifesting in the form of increased self-confidence, awareness, and respect for the for the independence of individuals and a desire to make a positive difference in their own lives and in the lives of other people. As a nonprofit organization, NWABS has been serving over 1,600 students this year alone, impacting thousands of lives in the process. We hope to continue to grow as an organization, integrating equity and inclusion into every aspect of our organization, culture, and infrastructure. Before we continue, um, operating within outdoor spaces requires the acknowledgement of the land we recreate and the injustices that have that having continued to take place in the course in our courses areas. The Portland headquarters is built on the traditional land of Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, and Molala along with many other tribes who lived along the Columbia River. Today, Portland has a large urban, a large urban Native American population with over 380 federal recognized tribes representing in the Portland metro area. The Odin Falls Base Camp, compromising the Warm Springs of Wasco and Paiute tribes. The Mazma Base Camp is on the ancestral lands of the Lakana Pamuk and the Okunagan tribes. We acknowledge the systematic policies of genocide, relocation and assimilation that have and continue to impact many indigenous Native American families. We recognize that we are here in this land was occupied and its traditional people were displaced by colonists and settlers. As guests on this land, we honor with gratitude both the land itself and the people who have been stewards of the land of the past and present. Today, we are welcoming an outstanding panel today. We have with us today, Wes. He is an NWABS instructor in Portland team, in Portland, in Portland leader at Vamonos Outside. We have Cody, American Alpine Club, Club, Club Climb United Director, Melody, Oregon Adaptive Sports Education and Training Manager, and last but not least, we also have Shelma, founder of Flash Foxy and Flash Flock Foxy Climbing Festival. I'd like to pass it on to Wes so he can introduce a little bit more about himself. Hi everyone, thanks for uh, being here. Uh, like Myra said, I am a uh, field instructor for, for NWABS, but I've been instructor for two other schools, uh, Colorado and uh, uh, around California. I've been a intern, logistics coordinator, assistant instructor, lead instructor. Um, I've been with OB for five years, five, yeah, five years, five seasons. I'm based in Bend at the moment. Um, and there I started to engage more into my community and doing what I do is to be outdoors. So uh, with Bound with Outside, we are doing a lot of projects to get people outdoors, specifically people who are Latino and, and other people, other BIPOC people as well. Um, it was a fresh new organization, barely a year old, and we are slowly moving uh, to be more, to be a voice for those people in our community. Um, I'm originally from LA, but I moved to Oregon when I was in sixth grade and I bounced around all over the West, uh, living in Colorado, Nevada, and Oregon. So I've 
yeah, come to learn and love uh, the Northwest and just the West in general with all its different peoples that we see. Hey everyone, my name is Cody Cameron, he, him, his, um, the director of Climate Added for the American Alpine Club. And I'm currently located in Salt Lake City, uh, but I actually grew up in Oregon. I was a transracial adoptee. So I was adopted into a, a white family based out of Tillamook. Uh, so I grew up in Tillamook and spent most of my life there until moving out to Portland, uh, where I lived for a decade before San Diego. So I've got a lot of uh, uh, connections and love to the uh, Pacific Northwest. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, you know, in addition to the work in Climb United, I also um, serve on the board for the Salt Lake Climbers Alliance and sit on the Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. So doing what I can to, to support the community um, and find ways to push those cultural transformation and pull on those levers as we can. And also, um, we've founded a BIPOC affinity space in Salt Lake um, where we do gym meetups, but we're also finding ways to, uh, to educate um, our community and, and get them outside and get them outside in a safe way to enjoy uh, climbing the way they want to and not the way that they're told that they should. So very excited to be here. So thanks for, uh, for allowing us. Hi, Melody Cheher. I'm based here in Bend, Oregon. I work for Oregon Adaptive Sports as the education and training manager. I, uh, we work to uh, improve access and remove barriers to the outdoors in a multitude of store sports. Um, and we really focus on, um, letting the outdoors be as it is and helping like mine the gap so that we can, so people can actually access uh, what we all love and thrive in, in those outdoor spaces. Good evening, everyone. Um, I say evening because I'm calling in from New York, from Brooklyn, New York, uh, the ancestral lands of the Lenape people. My name is Shalma Dunn. I use she, her pronouns. And um, it sounds like I have the least connection to to the Pacific Northwest of all of our panelists today, but I shall do my best to say relevant things um, as it relates to the outdoor community at large. Um, I'm the founder of Flash Foxy, which is a climbing organization that used to run a festival called the Women's Climbing Festival. And we used to uh, provide resources and education and a space for women. And we recently expanded to also, um, expanded our mission to also serve gender queer folks. Um, I am also, uh, filmmaker and writer in the outdoor industry. I'm currently working on a feature length film about conservation through the lens of hunting and climbing. Um, I'm a board member of the Access Fund, which is a national climbing uh, stewardship and conservation nonprofit and um, on the steering committee of a national organization called Recreate Responsibly. And yeah, I'm super excited to be here and hear what everybody else on our panel has to say today. Awesome. We have an amazing and diverse panel today. Uh, I'd also like to take a little bit to highlight our technical facilitator. He will be moderating the session through the chat. And I would like to remind you that at the end of our Q&A, we will open the virtual floor for our audience to ask their own questions to our panel. I don't know if Max wants to say a few words. Yeah, welcome everyone. My name is Max. I work here on the admin team in Portland for the Northwest Outward Bound School. So I'm excited to help with the technical side of this. Uh, make sure everything goes smoothly. So just a reminder, please keep your microphones on mute to avoid any distractions. And uh, I'll moderate the chat throughout the conversation today. Um, we'll try our best to get to as many questions. We'll try to draw out any themes that might come up so we can get those addressed, um, but feel free to chat amongst yourselves as well if you find that there's some interesting topics that are worth noting, thumbs up, stuff like that. But yeah, thank you all for being here. Awesome. Well, thank you again to each and, each and every one of you who took time from their day to be here. We will begin with our very first question. This question is actually for Cody and for Melody, and it is, what does a diverse equitable and inclusive outdoors look like to you? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because uh, it's one that we hear a lot. And 
And, and I think it comes with a bit of misunderstanding of what, uh, what the uh, equity and inclusion are, right? Like uh, diversity is, we are diverse. Uh, it's not something that we work towards uh, in terms of like this work, this, the community is diverse. Um, and inclusion right now, I think in the outdoor industry, um, it's actually like used as a euphemism for assimilation, right? So we're saying like, yeah, we are an inclusive community as long as you fit this mold of what dominant culture expects and then in some ways defines you to fit. Um, and, and I think that I can use, I'm all using myself as an example of that, right? I, I'm white adjacent, having been raised by a white family, I have um, a very Western name. Um, and I think that I'm palatable for a lot of uh, industries and organizations, including the American Alpine Club, the one that I work for. <laughs> um, and it gives me a space in the room that a lot of folks are not welcome into. And and that's that's what it looks like today. And you know, I think the last thing I'll say um, is we can call it a step in the right direction, but I, I kind of challenge that. And not kind of, I challenge that pretty heavily. I don't think it's a step in the right direction. I think it's um, a misstep. Uh, I think it furthers folks who should be uh, at the table informing us um, you know, how to move forward with actual inclusion um, by, by filling the table in that space with folks that um, look and sound and, and have the lived experience that I do. Uh, so my goal with what we're doing with Climb United is to build a space big enough that that someone who's never been allowed in the room can actually have a leadership role in that room and I can get the hell out of that space, <laughs> so. Amazing, thanks Cody, that was awesome. Um, so I wanna, I actually want everyone to imagine a space where you are really comfortable in. And, you know, for me, my core sport is, um, you know, is alpine skiing and I, play in all these other spaces as well. And, uh, and you know, and, and even if we wanna focus on climbing or mountain biking, I want you to think about all of the little things that you do because you know that sport. All the things that we don't talk about. We don't talk about how to dress right. We don't talk about how to move from fantasy to reality. And that space becomes a barrier to being able to get out and play. Like, I mean, I talk when, you know, I think of little things like, how tall should your socks be, right? And, and yes, you know, those little nuances, they seem dismissible, but I can tell you that when, when someone wants to show up to play, if they're going climbing and they are wearing restrictive pants, it's probably not gonna be fun. But we also don't generously give the information that that person needs to be successful. And when we, ref when, when we assume that people have the information they need to be able to get outside and access play, we actually take away a massive step for everyone. And before we even know it, we've created a gap that doesn't have to be there. I think about how much energy I expend to try to hustle to be as Cody Stout talked about assimilation. Like I, I feel like even in the, the sports that I am considered an expert in, you know, I still feel like I'm hustling to belong. And that is exhausted, is exhausting. And we are instantly tapping into that sense of belonging. We are just dropping people down that Maslow's hierarchy into that safety and security, or we're into that space where people are no longer comfortable. And so I challenge you to think about that sport that you have knowledge in, that outdoor space that you have knowledge in, and what is the thing you can share that will help connect people to having the knowledge they need to have to be successful so that it no longer comes with, are you wearing the right gear? Did you buy the right brand? You know, have you assimilated to the core culture so that you can be welcomed, right? We oftentimes think, oh, we need to reject that wholeheartedly in order for it to move forward. How can we just bring people along and stop making that information exclusive? Let's give it to everyone. It's not valuable, <laughs> let's share it, right? Let's give people the currency they need to be able to rise up and to smell the trees and the rock and get dirty and scrape themselves. Let them draw blood because they're outside playing. Yeah, give them that chance. Thanks. Yeah, those were great answers. I think that's, um, there's a mindset for that that everyone has 
where it's like, oh, somebody else will tell them, somebody else will step up, somebody else will do it. But no, it's gotta be you, it's gotta be us. Yeah, don't give the role to somebody else, like take on the challenge. Our next question here is for Shelma and for Cody as well. And the question is, with the growing movement to rename racist, sexist, and homophobic climbing routes, how can the outdoor community come together to rename these routes and improve culture, culture around climbing? Um, I can go first. Uh, I'll go first because I bet Cody has a lot of stuff to say about this because he works on this specifically. So maybe if I go first, I can like preemptively say things um, before he says everything. Um, you know, I would say like, you know, things have gotten really heated in the, around this conversation of changing the names of climbing routes. And, you know, if I was in a room having a conversation about this, I would kind of start the entire conversation with kind of the question of why do you climb? Like, what do you get from climbing? What do you get from being outdoors? And almost everyone's going to say they love climbing because they love being outside, connecting with the landscape, touching the rock, being able to get away from their life and the work that they're doing. It feels like a way to connect to um, something that you don't normally get to connect to in your everyday life. You get to be challenged in these. Days. There's all these amazing reasons why you know, we climb or mountain bike or paddle or whatever your sport is, right? And so kind of, you know, let's, and I would say almost everybody would probably have really similar answers to like what they, what they get from climbing. And then kind of, I think the next question would be like, all right, well, like, imagine if you got to a climbing area and there was something that was like horribly offensive to you, that would probably put you in a really bad mood. It would probably distract you and probably make you not feel that welcome there. It would probably make you feel a little uncomfortable. Um, if you sent this route, you probably would want to call your mom and tell her about it. Like, you know, and so, you know, if we kind of ask like, well, here are all these things that are supposed that we are supposed to be climbing for, which is healing and connection and all of these things. And if something as simple as the name of a route can totally make it incapable of someone to have these experiences, which we all are saying are the reasons why we're out there, then doesn't it, don't you feel also that we should change those names? Because shouldn't everybody have the ability to have the same experiences that we all want to be having when we're climbing? And so, I mean, I think if we can kind of take it away from this initial knee-jerk reaction of the defensive of like, you know, the first ascensionist has named this, like you're being sensitive and just think really about like, why do we climb? What do we get out of it? And if there is something as simple as a name that is impeding someone from getting those valuable um, outputs from climbing, shouldn't we just make this really simple change, right? The argument that it is, it's just a name, why are you getting so offended by it? Well, if it's just a name, why don't we just change it? Um, is kind of the question that I would pose in response. Um, and, you know, and I think like something kind of uh, adjacent to this conversation is, you know, the co constant conversation when people talk about um, accessibility, about being welcome, about inclusion, you know, they're often told to keep politics out of climbing. And, you know, I think this is another example of, you know, people don't want to bring that. We all just want to go to the climbing area. I don't really want to think about all these like social economic social justice issues like i would too would like to just go and have a really good time with my friends and try really hard and get shut down um and eat a lot of snacks um and i do think we all aspire to do that it's just there are these things that are kind of in the way right now so i think if we can move the conversation to um dismantle some of these discriminations that exist then we all would prefer to just go out and have a good time Yeah, I, I entirely agree with, with all of that. And, you know, it's funny when we started Climbing United uh, almost seven months ago now, <laughs> it feels like it's been longer. We, um, we knew that starting with route names would rile people up um, because uh, folks love to stand on a hill of you know, subversiveness and counterculture and freedom of speech and all this kind of like, hackneyed attempt to hide their bigotry and so we uh, we really weren't doing anything that was new this is work that has been in process for decades um and folks have been doing this and asking some national organization to take at least some sort of courageous stance in this and what we did i don't think was even near that it was simply to say well here's what's being done and we're going to give us some guidelines some bumpers 
um, for folks to stop being so so outwardly aggressive to like with discrimination. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes uh, we talk about the club that, and we use a, a line that that is supposed to also kind of like get people a little bit that we don't care so much about route names um, as much as we do about the culture that has allowed that to exist. So that has allowed people to come in and say, yeah, I want to use like outwardly derogatory terms and phrases in a rock climbing route. Like it's just dumb. And, and, you know, so what we're trying to do is, is look at the culture through a lens of perhaps like a route name. Right. And, and those conversations, they, they get kind of ridiculous uh, with folks who, uh, you know, FAs who, who put these up and use these names and, and myself and people in this room, we've all put routes up and, you know, they try to use that against so like, you don't know the work. I'm like, well, <laughs> I do. So let's not talk about that. Um, but they stand on this like idea of freedom of speech. Like, that's fine. Yeah, you have all the freedom of speech. Yeah, that, that's right. And you can put that route name in the guidebook if the publisher chooses to publish it with your name right next to it. And the community will know who you are and what you stand for. And I hope you enjoy that. Um, and and uh, the last thing I'll mention is in this work, what we have done is we've we've kind of given the the publishers our support as the American All Pine Club to say, yeah, we agree with you. Like, this is ridiculous. And it's, you know, in many ways, low hanging fruit, like, let's just, let's just change these things. But we don't want to just do it on our own. So the publishers are working with the authors and the first ascensionists, and we're just asking them if they'd like to change it. And we're holding space for those conversations to speak to their hearts, as cheesy as that sounds, to try to see if they can understand exactly what Shelton was talking about, right? Like, this is really impeding folks' ability to go out and experience joy in this sport. And, and we like to think that you put all the work into uh, establishing these routes so we can all enjoy them um and if that's not the case like the door swings both ways like we don't need you here in this conversation if you want to stand on this hill of again your hackneyed attempted at subversion to use these words in a route name like if, if you're not willing to have that conversation with us then we don't need you in the room and we're very okay with saying that because they're not here to uh to help this culture go forward um and we are and uh, so we're glad that these conversations are happening. But again, we're very, very interested uh, more so in the culture that's behind it and where we can do better and what levers we can pull on to uh, to be better and, and no longer think, well, the next generation is going to get it right. Because clearly that, that hasn't happened and uh, we're, we're not OK with that. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Mel, did, did you have something to say? Or, oh, okay. Well, um, some questions are directed to certain panel members. However, if you want to add on, like, please do. Like, please open up your mics and, and put your own input too, if you'd like. It's not strictly for Shelma and Cody. Um, but yeah, we are grateful for all that hard work that, that y'all are doing. It takes a lot of courage to take that stand. So, um, this other question is for Wes and for Cody as well. Are there microaggressions you frequently see in the outdoors? And has that shaped your experience going outside recreationally or professionally? Yes, definitely. I think uh, the outdoors and the way we see it is just a extension of our society at the um, at this present time. And you know, in our society, we people of color and other non-dominant um, people from non-dominant groups have, do get uh, microaggressions wherever they are. But in the outdoor space specifically, I think the main one that I've experienced being a, a brown uh, male in you know these, in these uh, places is kind of the equivalent to mansplaining to females is the, you know, white splaining from someone who is white and trying to give me uh, information or beta or trying to tell me how to do things correctly when I do have the, the skills and the, the experience uh, to do everything that should be uh, done, yeah, the way it should be done. And so I feel like I've been, when that happens, just, I think people just, yeah, I just feel like, uh, like I'm not good enough, I guess, to be out there or I don't look the part that I'm not uh, an imposter being out there um you know so i try to when i know i'm gonna be around those type of people or a large number of people i try to like dress like i belong i dress like 
both with my, with my gear on correctly and like not be able to add any more of my personal kind of flair to it. Um, I'm also like super picky with who I recreate with. Uh, make sure that I also trust the people that I go out with and that I'm going to have a good time with them. And if it's someone new, I try to ask a bunch of questions before they, I like want to go out there. I want to make sure that I'm like in a safe place and, and have like a safe exit as well if, if it doesn't work out. Um, yeah, I think the white twenty is like kind of like, I don't know, I don't know if anyone's heard that term before. I might just made it up, but um, it's happened to me quite a few times and, you know, like I work hard to, for, I've worked hard for my like AMGA certifications and I've had a ton of experience. And so that just like be, belittles me. And um, the, the worst part too is like, I don't know if people, other people even know that, that, that they're doing that. And so that's also just makes it super uncomfortable and awkward to talk about then. Uh, so that's just one thing. I'm sure other people might um, feel something similar in doing that. Um, other microaggressions. Well, when I used to, I used to live out of my live out of my car more often uh, for a few years, but I didn't own a van. I uh, couldn't afford a van, uh, so I just lived out of my little little Nissan Altima, my sedan, and it wasn't like the best car. It didn't look the the, the cleanest or on the on the, on the outside. Um, but when I was traveling around, going from job to job, I was, uh, you know, I had to be very, very careful about where I went, um, especially in some rural areas and where I parked my car to, to stay the night. Um, you know, I'm a brown and I'm fairly big. I'm two, I was I'm anywhere from two to 220, uh, depending, depending, yeah, a few years ago, um, you know, and for some people that can be I could be perceived as as a risk as a threat and so I kind of just had to remove myself from what I from those situations just because I'll get some you know dirty looks or maybe yeah, people get scared and you know do something that I don't want them that want them to do I'm just like I, you know I was just, I'm just a dirtbag traveling through the desert and traveling through these areas just because I'm not in them you know I'm more at risk, I guess, what because of my skin is brown and uh, I don't live, in, I don't wasn't living out of out of a van. Um, yeah, so I used to be very careful with those and really, really think about it a little bit more because um, the consequence might be a little higher. Uh, leave some space for uh, Cody to chat more. I think I'm gonna flip it around a little bit. And and from my experience as a cis hetero male and and the actions that that I um, have exhibited and and folks um, other cis hetero males towards especially cis women and non-binary trans femme non-conforming climbers um, because I think microaggressions are very very uh, they can be I don't want to say nuanced but we can all commit them all the time and we we talk about it in climbing a lot and it's beta sprain. And I think that it goes beyond that in that, you know, folks like myself, uh, it can be really impactful to the experience of, again, cis women, trans femme, non-binary, and non-conforming climbers when we are assholes. And we assume that um, they want our advice because we think that might be really attractive somehow, because I could go on, on and on about that as a million causes, but... It's really damaging. And, and I think that actually we need to name it what it is. And maybe this whole beta sprain concept is, is too light and it is aggressive and it is a microaggression. And it also borderlines um, outward uh, aggressiveness when it becomes like um, really persistent when, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to say I've not done this, but people around me have done this and I didn't say anything and I should have um, in that they, they use it as a very um, aggressive stance to try to, you know, like pound their chest, right? You either rip the shirt off and, and they just assume, oh, this group of women, they definitely want me to be part of their climbing day and they insert themselves into it and it's awful and <laughs> it needs to stop. Um, and I think if we can, again, call it what it is and, and put that in that microaggression slash aggression category, then we could have more meaningful conversations around it. Um, but I'm going to stop talking because we have more people on here that probably have a lot more to say about that 
that than I do that's more valuable. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if uh, Shelma or Melody would like to add to that. Um, I just wanted to quickly add, um, you know, I, I sometimes teach workshops about justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I found this really, really super helpful uh, animated video on YouTube. So if you kind of feel like you're a little confused about microaggressions or why there's such a big deal. There's actually a really, really great one where it compares microaggressions to mosquito bites. And, um, you know, if somebody, for example, I've had the instance where, you know, I might be at a climbing area and I might have all of like the gear that you need to lead a trad climb on my harness. And then somebody will come up and ask my climbing partner, who's a male, what they're going to put up, even though it's really obvious if you just looked for one second that I was the one who was going to be climbing um, right now. And, you know, somebody might say something like, oh, that's happened to me before, too. It's not a big deal. Like, why are you overreacting about it? And, you know, I would say it's like if you get one mosquito bite or like two mosquito bites, it's not really that big of a deal. But if you have like 75 mosquito bites on your body, it would be really itchy and like really terrible and distracting. And you would feel um, awful and kind of like maybe want to take a blowtorch to all the mosquitoes that are outside. And maybe the person with two mosquito bites is kind of like, whoa, like maybe you're overreacting with the blowtorch. It's just a mosquito bite. I don't know what the deal is. And I thought that was a really, really great example of kind of the impact of microaggressions that in of itself, one or two side comments or experiences might not be so damaging or so impactful, but actually if it then happens 75, 100, 150 times, it becomes a thing that is um, inescapable. And, um, and the way that you react to it will be in response to how often it happens to you versus somebody where it might only happen once or twice. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna speak to this in, this, uh, in reference to the adaptive space. And I'm also really proud that we actually train to this. Um, so it is happening in a, um, uh, in a, in out in this in the adaptive space where we train people who work with people who have diagnoses and disabilities how to speak to the person and how incredibly important it is um, to treat them as an athlete and not assume that when someone shows up that you are looking for a translator and we really talk about it like that and and to look within themselves and to maybe take a moment and try to understand what's uncomfortable about that for them. Because ultimately that's usually what's happening is maybe if somebody uses a wheelchair um, and maybe has some kind of like a speech apraxia, you know, so a delayed speech or maybe over articulation with the mouth, that's usually just uncomfortable for the first person speaking to the, the, to the athlete, as opposed to really looking and saying, wait a second, how can I move into my discomfort and to help to promote someone in, in this context, as opposed to moving into what's familiar and comfortable for me. And I think that's a huge thing and a common underlying factor um, with a lot of what we're talking about is we're talking about create, asking people to get uncomfortable with things that they're super attached to, right? Like I want to be in control as, you know, someone who's moving into like route names, like I'm in control, I'm attached, that's my thing. I'm defending this thing and I don't even know why. Right? Like I'm uncomfortable with talking to a woman, you know, someone who presents, you know, like out in the wilderness, because that's, that's a, you know, that's a cis space for men. Get out of here. You know, you don't know how to, how to climb. Like, I mean, it's, it's just these, these old, old rhetorics that get tied up and they reiterate a message that the space then stays exclusive. It's just for this person. It's just for a person who fits the stereotype. And when we show up, you know, speaking for OAS, you know, uh, Oregon Adaptive Sports is like when we show up with people who use a hand cycle to get to a climbing route, people cannot imagine how that person is going to climb. And when people are asked to consider what they don't already know, it usually promotes a sensation of discomfort. And they're asked to expand themselves. And not all humans want to do that. People are usually pretty well, you're pretty comfortable being within what they know. And we're asking them to change that. Stuff's hard. All right, I'll stop. I, I just want to build on that real fast, Melody, because I, I love that because oftentimes in this work, you know, the the opposing side will say, well, it's, 
you know, y'all are being too, too sensitive, you know, to toughen up, uh, which I find laughable because uh, it's, it's so simple to say like, this is my comfort zone. You're encroaching upon it. So you need to get tougher. Right. Uh, but the second we ask people to be uncomfortable and, and think differently with their hearts and with empathy, it's like, you, you've just like dropped a nuclear bomb on them and they don't know what to do. It's like, well, see now who's the actual one who doesn't know how to be tough. Um, uh, but, you know, you say that and there's a whole raft of stuff. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, thank you all for responding to that. Those were um, like amazing different points of views. Uh, I think I heard somewhere, especially in Spanish, there's like a saying where it's like, if you're comfortable, you're not growing. You're not. You're not making a difference. You can only grow and and change and move forward if you're out of your comfort zone. Yeah. This um, next question is for Wes and for Shelma. What is the best way for the outdoor community to support BIPOC leaders? Uh, I'll I'll start with that question. I think. Um, Something that's been a really um, huge issue for a long time is just uh, wages and pay. Um, it's definitely um, it's definitely not easy being a field instructor or just working in the industry in general um, from in all positions, especially when we work in, we're working for nonprofits or you know organizations that mean really well. They are often those organizations that, that uh, pay the, the least and, and the work is great, but we can't uh, sustain our lives on just on, on just that. You know, I think, so I think one way is for the outdoor industry to come through with more financial support and to pay a good living wage. And if that needs, you know, if the system needs to change, then we should change the, the structure of it all. Um, definitely had, had a lot of times where um, where I've like thought about not pursuing this anymore because of that reason, and it sucks when you want want to continue to do something you really love and you're you're good at, and the one thing that's really stopping you is money. You know, it's like money money has was has been controlling your life right there. So that has been a huge conversation in most uh, organizations that I've worked for. And there are a few now that are really addressing that um, for for guides and, and instructors, and um, you know, happy and uh, super super stoked to be part of one uh, with the uh, climbers of color that do pay their guides um, a great a good a good wage, and it's, it feels good. You feel uh, valued and heard at when you when you get get that conversation. So it does go far. Um, you know, if the money's good, people people will buy pop people will come. And if they come and their money's still good, you know, they'll stay. And uh, hopefully that continues to change uh, in here in the next few years as well. Thanks, Wes. Yes, and let's abolish unpaid internships while we're at it. Um, yeah, um, I was looking at this question and writing some notes this afternoon. And, you know, I'm gonna kind of, I guess, talk a little bit like, when we say outdoor community, it felt like a little bit vague. I was like, are we talking about non-BIPOC folks or like, does this include everybody? So I kind of want to make a couple of distinctions there. I think if you're not, and just to like clarify in case people don't know, BIPOC means black, indigenous and people of color. If you're not BIPOC, I would say the very first thing to do is um, ask people <laughs> what would help them and what would be supportive. Don't assume that you know what they need or what is lacking or what their challenges are or what is causing them to not be able to engage in the way that they want to. Um, I think also understanding that we are not a monolith, um, not within any historically, like in the category of historically excluded and like not even within a specific affinity group. Um, and also like kind of moving on with that, like understand that BIPOC leaders are not, are they're just one person. Um, and their opinion does not like mean it's the opinion of everybody from that affinity identity. And I think a really good example of that is, you know, we don't have any indigenous people on this panel um, today. And, you know, we are using this term BIPOC, BIPOC, but like the conversation for indigenous folks 
is really, really different than for a lot of other, um, for uh, people of color, black folks, though, you know, there are Afro indigenous and other mixed race indigenous folks. I do want to take a moment to acknowledge that, but, you know, tribal sovereignty, lack of recognition for tribal identity, um, access to ancestral lands for ceremony or just for recreation. I mean, these are issues that are really, really specific to indigenous folks. That doesn't really apply to someone like Cody or myself or Wes, right? And so I think like just making sure that you understand that not every issue is gonna be the same for every group. Um, and then I would say, you know, kind of the second thing that you can do, I think is continue your personal learning and growth and understand that like what we see here in the outdoor community is a microcosm of what is happening in our society as a whole and to really fight this we can't really just fight it here in, in the outdoor industry we have to fight against institutional racism against systemic discrimination and that comes from um, who we vote for what bills are passed um, what kinds of um, ideologies our institutions hold um, and how you know if we really want to dismantle and those kinds of issues in the outdoor space and support what BIPOC leaders are trying to do in this space. I think we need to be um, working on that at a national broader scale, as well as like on our own personal growth. Yeah, I would like to agree with that. That I think I would tell people this, that, you know, if, we want, if you want to combat diversity and equity inclusion in the outdoors, you really have to look at the societal and political policies uh, our government has passed um, within our country and in other countries as well. This is just a, yeah, it's just a, just symptoms of what we're actually experiencing in the greater role of our society. So for me, you know, it's great for to see people be um, willing to explore like uh, unconscious bias and how to be an ally or anti-racist. That's awesome. You know, now is the time also to really explore the history of the people around you the how they've been oppressed in, in the past or how they've been marginalized in the past and what policies have affected those communities and how has that changed their culture. Um, that will tell you more about what, um, about those people and how to approach those people and you know create more empathy because you'll know more of their background and also show that those show those people that you are willing to learn and willing to uh, discover some uncomfortable histories of our nation um, and how it affects those people. So I, yeah, I would have, I would have said to, to try to be excited about learning history. I know a lot of people, history wasn't their favorite subject in school, but it was mine. But um, yeah, it's a lot of, a lot we can learn from the past. And I think if we, for, you know, don't, don't use it for the future coming soon, um, we could just repeat it again. And we have and hopefully you can change that. Thank you. I don't know if there's anyone else that would like to add on to that before we continue. I do just wanna say, I think one thing that individuals can do is, is you know, examine the positions in your organizations and your companies that have decision-making power, especially with uh, heavy influence on how the financials are um, disseminated and and do what you can to uh, to break down cronyism in uh, corporations, which is essentially it's it's kind of like you know when you you open a position up and and so and so knows somebody and they bring them in and they're an old buddy from another company or university and they look like them and they talk like them and so on and so forth. So what we can do is we can flood those openings with with folks um, from our communities. Um, who might not be at the table or didn't go to that university, isn't belong to that social group, and, and make sure that we get people who have those powers in those positions. And oftentimes, um, there, there are pushes to get, you know, fill boards with, uh, with underrepresented folks, which is great, um, but also boards have a limited power in how um, pay is disseminated throughout an organization and uh, the daily operations, which is what really affects uh, the lives of, of us as um, uh, employees or uh, yeah, as employees. So again, look at what those positions are and let's fill those seats with folks who are generally not even anywhere near those rooms. Thank you for sharing. 
Um, Melody, what has been your best experience in the outdoors and what made that experience so special? Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, I think I, I'm gonna be a little bit of a generalist on this and I'm pulling from such an awesome diverse array of being outside. And I would say it's the, for me personally, it's the frequency of having wind on my cheeks and the smells that show up um, of being outside. But I think that the generosity that I can give and exchange with others is the things that the thing that makes it exceptional and I'll speak to like I come from a history of like I've worked in Switzerland I've worked at resorts ski resorts and and outdoor areas and um and I'll tell you the things that grab my heart is being outside with someone you know and for example like along the Deschutes River here in Bend um heading up to a past Dillon Falls with someone who has never ridden a bike before and typically spends their weeks, their days inside uh, because that's how they've been treated is that they don't have access to that. And to, for me, what that exceptional outdoor experience is taking something, is, is a renewed energy for, for that space and looking through it through that lens of sharing it where Historically, I rode past those areas and didn't think twice. And this person is in awe and I get to share it with them. And that for me is a repeatable experience. And that translates to any kind of outdoor space. So that renewed love. Yeah, and this is a question that you're all open to answer. So I'll, I'll ask it again. Uh, what has been your best experience in the outdoors and what made the experience so special? You know, I actually, I, I want to answer this and I think it helps kind of inform uh, why this work is so special to me. Uh, my grandfather and I had a pretty troubled relationship. Um, he was, uh, and I, I've been unpacking this with my, uh, with my mother. I mean, he was very racist um, and he, you know, he fought in the world wars and he was not the biggest fan of the fact that my folks uh, adopted a, uh, an Asian kid. And so uh, we didn't have much of a relationship until I was in junior high. I was, went on a fly fishing trip with them around Oregon for a week. My mom thought it was a good idea so we could build a relationship. I was so pissed off. I had my disc man and my Smashing Pumpkin CD and my headphones. And I was like, all right, I was going to ignore this old bastard. And <laughs> this is where I'm going to be with my headphones on. And throughout the trip, there were just all these things that, that brought us closer. And, and it was a series of events when, when I saw how protective he was of me and how he didn't start to notice you know, on Maupin and on Redmond and all these small towns around Oregon, how the community looked at me differently than they did him. If I was with him, they'd accept me. And if I was walking around by myself, they certainly did not. And I think that impacted him to show him how he was treating me, but also that like it showed me that he did care about me. And, and I saw him, he was a pretty rough old dude. And I saw him get fairly aggressive with people who were, you know, uh, maybe showing signs of, of aggression towards me. And, and after that trip, we became very close um, around fly fishing and around the outdoors. And he told me about all of his trips. That's where he, you know, that was all he had when he was growing up working on farms and logging and stuff was the outdoors. And so I think it, it, it brought us together. It took me years to realize that. And so now in this work, this is an op opportunity to show folks like, this is not where everyone goes to heal, um, but this, this could be where more people go to heal if we do it right. Um, and, and we don't have to recreate that, that problematic story you know, over and over again. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that experience. Uh, Wesley, Shoma, would you like to add something? Yeah, uh, I think it's, this is probably the hardest question of all the questions here. Um, I could say a lot, there's a lot that I have uh, I think the one that really just speaks out to me, um, I didn't say this earlier when I introduced myself, but I run a kids program for Latino kids here in, in Bend, and it's an outdoor based program. Um, and we're kind of also just defining, redefining what it means, what outdoor means. 
And for us, uh, for me and these kids, we, you know, we, we take these kids from a low income housing uh, complex in Bend and we walk them to a park nearby. And uh, I think that has been really special just to provide access for these kids to experience something that's green because they don't have that green space back at their house and they live across a really busy street and their families can't always take them to the park but it's so close you know but yet so far away and so for me to be able to help these children just to access these this uh, green grass and trees and explore in the rocks a little bit um you know something that i'd never had when i was in los angeles living in the inner city um and you know a lot these kids really remind me of myself and my family and I think I just put a lot of uh, love into these those children, and just to give them that space to hopefully you know implant implant them, plant to see that you know that nature is you know, the outdoors is for them, and they can have fun outdoors and be comfortable. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to implant that that perspective that in, into them, and so that in the future they can follow those pursuits if they want to. But it, it, all it takes is a tree or a garden or a park. Um, you don't have to go to these like rad places like Smith Rock or the, the Shoots River. Um, it could be your neighborhood park. And I think that has been uh, one of the best experiences so far this last year of working with them and just seeing them have fun. They don't care where they are. They'll have fun with whatever they have. And that has been, has been super special. I feel like a lot of pressure from this from this question. <laughs> I don't know. Like I don't know if I could pick the best experience I've ever had in the outdoors. Um, totally without permission, I'm going to tweak this question and answer something totally different. <laughs> um, I would say like, what is like you know maybe the question I would find easier to answer is like, what is my favorite thing? Like, what is the best thing about being in the outdoors for me? Right and. Um, I think that doesn't have to do with any specific instance or experience, but I would say like kind of what drew me to climbing initially was really um, the first time I was ever on a multi-pitch rock climb. I was 350 feet up in the air, hanging on the side of a wall. And it was the first time that I ever felt like I was part of the landscape, like part of what was happening there. You know, I think we you know, I grew up going to national parks and state parks all the time. I grew up in California and, you know, I think we're looking at nature all the time. We like pull over at the side of a road. We look at something at a landmark, we look at it and it's like over there and like, wow, that's so cool. We're over here. That thing over there is really neat. And, you know, being on the side of a wall kind of in the like Alpine, it was this first feeling of like, wow, I'm part of what's happening here. I'm hanging here on this wall. And this wall has been here for millions of years. And if there was a giant book on the history of this wall on like page, I don't know, like 1 million and 74, one line would include me in it, you know? And like that realization felt really cool and exciting to me. And, you know, and I don't think you have to be a climber to find that, you know, I found that similar connection very recently through hunting, um, through split boarding. So I think there are other ways to remind ourselves that this isn't a human centric world, that this, that like you, we haven't actually been here that long. And um, that, but we're also not separate. It's not like there's nature and then there are us. Like we're part of nature. I know we try to like build these things that are separate, but we're actually part of what's happening. And like being in the outdoors, my favorite part about it is like that, um, that realization is, um, unequivocal in those moments. Awesome. Um, we have a last question here. Uh, Melody and Shelma, or if anyone else wants to answer as well. Where do you hope the outdoor industry will be in the next 10 years regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion? I can go. <laughs> um, I, I really hope that we're in a space where, um, where anyone who wants to play can, and that we have removed boundary, we've removed barriers, we've improved access, um, and that 
we as we as humans who go out and play and um, who help grow these activities and sports and um, and whatnot are conscientious of how we impact the access for others as well. Um, and we are in a space where that person who wants to fantasize can make it a reality. Sorry, I feel like I just spoke. Um, I was thinking about this and, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the acronym of like diversity, like DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusivity, kind of circling back to what Cody said um, in response to the first question. Um, like, you know, I think we say these things in this broad term all the time, but they're actually three separate things and they all mean different things with different challenges. And so when I kind of thought about this question about where we want to be in 10 years, you know, I think each of those, I have like a different idea around that. And actually like the acronym of DEI is kind of in the wrong order. I feel like the progression should really be like diversity, inclusion and equity, but obviously DIE is a terrible acronym. So it's probably why we don't use that one. Um, but, you know, like, like Cody kind of said, you know, diversity is like, having all different types of people there, all different, um, of all different, you know, places, of different lifestyles, of different cultures, of different abilities. And, you know, I really hope that in 10 years, we'll see that diversity. Um, like, you know, Cody said, like, we're already seeing it in the community level. I'd love to see that diversity in all the different aspects of the outdoor industry, uh, whether it's like at elite levels of high end athletes, whether it's leadership, especially like senior leadership of outdoor companies and outdoor organizations. Um, you know, inclusion is you might have a lot of diversity, but you might still not letting you might not still be letting people be who they are. So I, you know, we could have a big diverse group of people, but if everyone has to be committed to the one existing culture, it's not really going to be inclusive. If that's not the way you would recreate and now you're being forced to recreate that way, that isn't really inclusive. Right. And so I think like beyond seeing the diversity of having a lot of different people. Like I would love to see the expansion of the idea of what the culture behind the outdoors is and shift that so that it becomes broader. I'm not saying we have to abandon this dominant culture that exists right now. I think that it just becomes one of like many, many, many different cultures or dynamics or community um, or interaction that we see in the outdoors. And I think like that would be a more inclusive, you know, equally distributed multitude of cultures and, and ways to recreate. And then kind of finally around equity, which is, you know, about like, do we all have the same opportunities and access to the outdoors, to getting outside, doing the things that we want to achieve? I'd love to see um, more opportunities for folks not to only get outside, but to discover what their relationship to the outdoors is. And I think that kind of goes back to what Wes was saying is that like, it doesn't have to be in the Alpine, it doesn't have to be on top of a volcano. You know, what you define as outdoors can be so many different things. I live in New York City and I used to work in, um, designing public parks here, uh, using community-based design and community-based organization feedback. And, you know, to a lot of people here, the outdoors is barbecuing with their families. Like that's what they see as being outdoors. And that isn't any less outdoors than going on a hike somewhere really remote. And I think we need to be able to remember that um, when we think about equity. And sorry, I've been talking for a long time. I just have one last thing. I do think, um, I also hope that in 10 years we'll have more of uh, taking up the responsibility and accountability around indigenous land sovereignty. I hope that um, we will have acknowledged that, you know, the outdoor industry and the outdoor communities is huge industry, like multi-million, maybe billion, I don't really know what the numbers are, you know, revenue source to like industry that hugely benefits from stolen land. And I hope that we will be able to be acknowledging that and giving back in some way um, to the indigenous communities uh, that have been negatively impacted by colonialism. <laughs> Thank you, Shoma. And don't worry, like, please keep talking. <laughs> if somebody asked me these questions, I wouldn't be able to answer them as wonderfully as you all are doing. <laughs> um, before we open the um, the floor to our audience to ask some questions. I don't know if Wesley or if Cody would like to tackle this last question as well. Uh, 
I'm putting y'all on the spot. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. I, I, love I, have you, a, yes. I just have a few thoughts. I think uh, just kind of building what Shoma said, I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see a lot of influx or change in our populations as well. And so that's going to spill over into the outdoor industry. And I think I hope that we could leave a uh, space for that outdoor culture, that whatever it is, uh, to to change and change in ways that we're not going to recognize. And, and just that's kind of how other aspects of society work. And I think, yeah, just leaving that space and being okay with it. And, um, you know, even for myself, there's some parts of that culture that like I, I am really comfortable with, but then when it changes, I'm like, oh, I'm like, I don't, I'm back to learning again. And that's kind of, kind of uncomfortable and it's hard and it's more work. Um, in the next 10 years, yeah, more, more people are going to go out. And I think having, having space for, for their cultures and their languages and their backgrounds to kind of infiltrate everything else and kind of influence different styles, uh, different behavior, different way to say things. Um, and kind of, yeah, be accepting that's kind of where, where it should go, because if we're trying to talk about uh, diversity, right, that's kind of, that's kind of it, instead of this one group of people deciding the culture, then, you know, hopefully we can expand that, that uh, influence to other peoples. And yeah, it'll be super exciting to see how that, how that shakes out. I, th I think that, well, not I think, I know that there are a lot of ways I could address this question from like my professional and the volunteerism and like all those aspects. But I, I think I, get, I maybe can take a moment to be like really cheesy here and answer it. And I, in 10 years, right? Like if we look at our community members, um, you know, like the kids, like, like listen, a group of kids who are 10 years old right now, right? And, and they're dealing with this stuff um and, and and they know it's happening they're getting growing an awareness of it so if we imagine them at 20 10 years from now um i i would hope and, and not just hope but i think what we're all working towards is uh, a, a sense that in that 10 year span they won't have dealt with as much as as we had to um if when folks are like you know what what experiences led you to this or can you talk about some traumatic things that have happened it's like well you know if we look at ourselves between the ages of 10 and 20, there are way too many things to pull from, right? Um, just so many. And it, it would be great if that weren't the case for this next generation. If, uh, if I think that'd be a great indicator for us uh, in terms of this is all human work, right? So if we could talk to those kids and say, all right, you know, 10 years from today, like what was your experience growing up? Hopefully it's a lot more um, empathetic and joyful and supportive and there's a lot more embraces from the community than, than all of us have experienced. And I think that would be a really good sign of like this work is doing something. Um, it's something beyond like some measurables we see in, um, and, and, and I don't mean to say beyond that these are not worthy things, but like in media and in like our company structures and in these conversations, but like actual lived experiences are, are fuller and richer and better and don't deal with this, this stuff as much. I think would be really great <laughs> awesome thank you all for sharing i know i put some of you on the spot with some of these questions um but i mean you all just seem well prepped and passionate about this um topic about this conversation um with that said i'd like to open up the, the virtual floor to our audience members. If you have any questions for our panel here or for somebody in specific, you can go ahead and use the chat and, and ask a question. Or if you'd also like, you can uh, virtually raise your hand and, and open up your mics. I have got a question, uh, Nick here. Um, so first of all, just thank you everybody for your time and sharing your thoughts and perspectives. It's already been really valuable for me already. Um, so I'm a grad student and I'm pursuing an outdoor industry specific MBA. And a lot of my cohort has expressed that they feel like the outdoor industry, at least from what it looks like from the outside in right now, it looks like from diversity and representation standpoint, somewhat performative 
And I believe we all kind of want to make a push for the culture to move forward and transition. And as we kind of transition to being kind of insiders of the industry um, and make those changes, as insiders yourselves, like what are some suggestions that you can offer me that I can bring back to my cohort um, to be part of the larger solution and not part of the larger problem? Could I ask a clarifying question? Um, when you say like, what are some things to take back in terms of being uh, part of the solution? Like, what are what are some suggestions for future members of the outdoor industry? Is that who we're posing the question to? Yeah, yeah. People who are going to be like working in the office, not necessarily in the field, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I'll start off by affirming that a lot of it is performative. <laughs> um, I think it's not a coincidence that we saw the uprisings of the Black Lives Matter movement last summer, followed by a flurry of um, diverse initiatives or DEI initiatives from a lot of different brands in the outdoors. And, um, you know, what I'll say is this, is that like, I've been in the outdoor industry for about six years now, and I have definitely seen a pretty big shift, even in just the very, very superficial level of acknowledgement of these issues existing. So I do want to say like there has been progression in that moment in, or in the last five to six years, like six years ago, I couldn't even get people to like agree that sexism existed like and everybody knows a woman like not everybody knows like a BIPOC person or a trans person or a queer person but or like an adaptive person but everybody knows a woman and I couldn't even get them to like agree that sexism exists in the outdoors and so I feel like the fact that we're at a point where at least whether they are making meaningful change or not everybody knows they should be thinking about this or they should be doing something about it is I think a very, very, very low bar, but one I will say that we have like hopefully surpassed. Um, I would say it's kind of going back to a little bit of like what Cody said. I think it's like, yes, like having diverse faces in front of the images of like marketing, that's like the lowest hanging fruit. That's probably the easiest thing that you can do, right? And I think that if you do want to really create true change, I think um, it has to change who is behind the camera who is the director, who is the uh, brand director who chose the campaign that was gonna be made, who is the you know, vice president of marketing who approved that budget and approved that campaign, like who's the president who has a vision for the, for the entire company, right? And I think like having uh, more uh, a variety of ranges of experiences and perspectives in all these different senior leadership positions is what's going to be crucial for us to move the needle um, in in the outdoor industry. Yeah, I I, I, I very much agree with that. And I do want to um, kind of color my answer, Nick, by by the fact that I want to be very clear. I was raised by dominant culture to be part of dominant culture to be like a token you know, um, of that within corporate America. So, so my, my answer might still have some of that lean to it, uh, which I'm, I'm examining. And, um, but I, I do think there's a sense, you know, coming up in this time right now, where we as a community, we're start, we're, we're pushing that shift, right? We're starting to pull in those threads of cultural transformation and what that looks like and what that will be. A lot of corporations are not. Um, as Shalma just said, it is performative, right? Perception is reality. And y'all got it exactly right. A lot of what these organizations are doing is a flash in the pan. Um, and so we're all up against it, right? Like right now it's great. It's cool. It's awesome to be BIPOC, right? It's really neat. Um, but it won't be next year <laughs> unless we keep pushing for this. So this is my long winded way of saying, I, and, and I, I'm, I'm kind of, struggle to say this, but I think that you'll have to know and your cohort has to know, like walking into those rooms and those spaces, you are definitely going to be working with folks who see this as a trend and, and they're going to still hold in high regard those old school sentiments that I was raised in um, that are, you know, at all expenses, it's the bottom line, it's the company, community comes second. And we have to be, um, equally as aggressive and, and no community comes first. 
and the mental well-being of this the folks who make this organization and this corporation what it is comes first um and and, and this idea uh of inclusion as inclusion but not as assimilation is is top of mind um and we cannot be we can't blink in that because uh, the problem is the second we do it all goes away um so it puts a lot on y'all's shoulders as the next generation um and it's hard to do that uh, and to put it again on your shoulders but it's a big weight to carry um but i think your cohort is probably going to be ready for it I'd love to add to this. Um, I'm thinking a lot about how this, you know, I, what I'm hearing here is like, there'll be a new hot topic next year, you know, that or, or a marketing glitch next year. And, and the thing that I kind of keep rooting back to is how, especially in business, how are you participating and helping to cultivate a safe space for people to talk about these topics and get them wrong? and not feel like their job is threatened. Because the truth is, is that nobody here is going to get it right all the time. But if I know I can, I can show up and ask a question and say, hey, I don't know what that means. I don't know what, I don't know, you know, I don't understand this, or I don't know how to move forward to be supportive, or I don't actually understand what microaggressions are. Now I have a safe space so that I can learn. And so next year, when the new hot topic comes out, whatever it is, people are not afraid of it and following. They're willing to ask questions and to make sure they really can embrace it and bring it to whatever it is that they're influencing. And then you have a really deep seated connection to whatever it is, instead of just following a trend. And then you have a, a business model that can actually participate towards change like that's that's long lasting these quick fixes are not you know you might be able to build a huge valuable campaign off of off of a movement that's great but what about next year and then the year after and and what about when the person you know how do you have someone who can actually make sure you have somebody who's an expertise in that and what about the person who's scared to ask and actually say i don't get it like that's the foundation that I see be successful. And it requires people to actually hold safe space, which most, you know, I, I heard cronyism earlier. Most of those types of organizations don't. That's how it's kept the same. It's not okay to bring creativity and, and you know, a versatility to a workspace because then you're stepping outside of the bounds. That's another way that strategically you could start cultivating change and, participate in longevity. All right, I'm gonna stop there. And, and briefly, I'll say one more thing. So I'm, I'm talking a whole bunch, I apologize. Nick, feel free, uh, you, your core out, reach out. Um, I don't wanna speak for anybody else, but reach out directly to me. I'd, I'd be happy to, to chat with you about this stuff. And I think that's when we, we can start to, to like dismantle this idea, or not this idea, but the practice of supremacist thinking and cronyism and all these things in our industry, right? Is um, let's all let's all be working towards it together um, and be talking about it and and uh, yeah so please please do I'd be I'd be more than happy to uh, to see all's emails come across the inbox. All right, um, here in the private chat, there's a question for Melody. Uh, the first, it says, do you have advice on how to make people comfortable with the uncomfortable? And there's a second part to it, it says, do you experience a lot of resistance when people are trying to change to accept new ideas? It's a great question. I agree, <laughs> fabulous. Um, yes, practice. And also, so, and I, so when we're talking about skill acquisition around moving into discomfort, um, what I lead on is providing incremental experiences that are within the person's threshold. So think about, um, you know, think about noticing that someone is uncomfortable with something and 
but it being something small. So maybe it's it's something they're passionate about and they're saying, hey, you know, I, I want to keep this, you know, this um, offensive name to this climbing route. And clearly they're demonstrating, uh, they're demonstrating that they're uncomfortable with this to change and maybe they have some attachment. And I'm wondering if what I would look at is how can you decrease the size of that attachment a little bit and maybe start with something smaller. So starting with something like how do, you know, are you willing to look at yourself and notice where in your body you feel discomfort? And maybe that starts with eating a lemon and just noticing how that feels and noticing your, your physical reaction to it and then move towards being too hot. Now, how do you feel, right? How about when someone insults you and gives you an opportunity to see yourself? And when someone says something that's maybe hurtful, right? Now I'm building some skill. I can look and go, oh, that's that person, not me. And I can sit with myself and look and go, ooh, I have a funny, you know, for me, it's the, the bottom of my rib cage when I experience something discomfort and discomfort and it like has all these tingly feelings. And so I look at that and I go, oh, I need to pause and not react, you know? And I really like, I, and to pause and to be able to see the person where they're at and to be able to see myself where I'm at. And that increases the skill as, as well. So treating it just like you do to strengthen a muscle. You don't go out and grab the 100 pound dumbbells to get bigger biceps. You go out and you start where you're at and you build and you build and you build. And it can come, I think the more variety that you have, and the more you build your language, and I'm speaking directly to um, emotional and feeling fluency, there's some great research out there from Mark Brackett, um, who wrote the book Permission to Feel. He is out of Yale, and he, it helps to diversify your language, and you can start to say, hey, I'm uncomfortable, and now I have 16 different words to describe what it feels like. I'm going to continue to do that. How uncomfortable am I? Right? Am I coming out of my skin right now? That's okay. But let's see if we can bring you down. Another place to dive into that you can build some skill around that is, um, is really just looking into threshold. So over threshold is a place uh, that will provide you some, you know, at least a, a rabbit hole you can go get buried in if you want to. And to be able to uh, understand what it means when we're no longer available. And what I mean by that is like in these conversations where we, you know, we kind of came back through throughout the conversation about, you know, discomfort, being attached and starting to say things like, you know, you're sensitive, what's wrong with you? You know, that person's dumb. There's no productive conversation happening then. So being able to pause and, and come back within threshold so that that person can actually synthesize the information that's being exchanged as opposed to moving their, to their defenses. Because as humans, that's what we do. We defend what we think is necessary to survive and thrive. Did I answer your question all right? Uh, I think you did. <laughs> that <was powerful>. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, there's one last question here in the private chat. Um, and I believe it will be our, our last question. And it is for Shelma. It says, what small action items would you give the younger generation to shift the climbing culture related to equity, diversity, and inclusion? Great, we're just gonna end with a really easy small question. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that's a really, really great question. Um, you know, again, I think my answer depends on like where you find yourself on the spectrum of climbing, right? I think if you are someone in the mainstream dominant community, I would say some of the small actionable items you can do are you can, again, like I said before, like work on personal growth and, you know, kind of what Mel Melody said, being a being uncomfortable and using that as a way to grow. Um, I think um, finding people different from you, this is probably applicable to everybody because we're all an ally to somebody else in a different affinity identity. It's like, it is easy, it is almost natural for us to um, 
gather with the people most like us because we find it to be the easiest place to be in the least uncomfortable place to be in and so I think like if we can if you can make an effort to find all different types of people and not just know know who they are but really get to know them so you can really understand what their challenges their struggles their experiences um their joys all these things are um you are going to grow as a person and you growing is going to give you the skills that you um, to be able to stand up for things that are right to um, have that inform the decisions that you make that will help build the culture around you that will hopefully build the culture um, at large in our community um, is what I would say I think like um, you know I kind of go back to the story that Cody told about his grandfather and the fly fishing like I wish we had the ability to empathize immediately with every situation, even if, even if it's something totally unfamiliar to us. But oftentimes, the best way that we're going to be able to truly understand that somebody's experience is different than ours and often really oppressive or traumatic or, or unsafe is when somebody we really care about goes through that experience and it's going to hit us in a way that we can't unsee it, we can't turn away. And so the more that you have that in your close proximity of your friends and your relationships, the more you're going to um, have that capacity to grow. Thank you so much, Shelma. And thank you to all of you for, for being here, for taking time out of your day to be part of this. Uh, thank you to Wesley, Cody, Shelma, Melody. Um, it takes such courage to take a stand and to talk about this and to inform other people. Um, yeah, thank you for your transparency and your vulnerability for sharing your stories. Uh, really quick before we all log off, there is happy hour happening now in five minutes. So if you have not registered already, I believe you still can. There are links in the chat. So go ahead and click on it and register if you haven't already. And don't forget about tomorrow, we will be having the, um, oh, and it's right here in the chat already. <laughs> We're having the Circle Up Gala tomorrow. Again, if you don't, if you haven't registered yet, it's not too late. Go ahead and register, and we'll see you there tomorrow at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you, everyone. It's, it's a wonderful discussion. Should I do some fun exit music for everyone? <laughs> That's great. Hopefully we'll see everyone at the, uh, the happy hour after this. Yes, don't miss it. Thanks everybody. Hey Myra, great job. Thanks, Shalma, for joining us so late in your night. Bye. Have a good night, everyone. Yeah, take care. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Great job tonight. Thank yeah, you. Good job, you. Myra. That was awesome. Thanks for jumping in. All right. We'll see you Bye. around, all right? <laughs>